Hello and welcome to a new episode, a new episode of Your Damn Jets. Uh, today I'm going to talk about my chemo for my lymphoma. Um, the previous episode was the start of the chemo. This episode is going to be the rest of the chemo. And I've already recorded this episode prior to now, but I forgot to turn the mic on. So I didn't record any of my voice, just the uh, images. And I don't want to overdub my previous recording, so I need to record it again. Yay! Um, one thing I noticed uh, that I didn't do the last time I talked about my chemo and my diagnosis uh, is that uh, the oncologist that Johns Hopkins has assigned to me is Dr. Holdoff. And uh, he specializes in uh, cancer of the brain and things of the sort. Um, so the summary is that I was diagnosed on November 19th, 2020. I started chemo on November 21st. Two rounds have been done in the past uh, video. The tumor is gone. Um, and now I'm going to go on to have more chemo. Um, so on December 27th, the simple partial seizures came back, um, but they were much smaller in the magnitude than on June 5th. On June 5th, my the right side of my body was pretty much uncontrollable. The, the arm was raising in the air uh, without my doing so. It was just raising by itself. On December 17th, the seizures were much smaller. Uh, you know, if you had just looked at me and that, I mean, if you had looked at me and paid attention, you might have seen my discomfort and you know, the fact that my muscles on, on in the arm were contracting. But if you didn't pay attention, my I, I had seizures next to my wife and she didn't she didn't notice. She didn't know when I had a seizure. So they were much smaller in, in magnitude, but um, they came back. Uh, and I talked to my oncologist, and eventually um, you'll see what they did for that. And on December 17th, also I had the port installed. Um, I did ask my oncologist about uh, getting a port because the nurses were starting to mutter under their breath each time they were sticking me with the needle. Uh, because the methyl rexate chemo every time you have to be um, under uh, IV you know it's it's given by IV so either they have to stick you with a new needle every time or you have to have a port that they can then access so I got the port on December 17th my oncologist was happy about that um, port installation was not very eventful I, I slept through most of the installation uh, they gave me stuff to calm me ahead of time, and I, I just slept through it. Um, on December 17th, uh, my Kepra was increased to uh, new dosage, and the reason they did that was to control the seizures uh, that had come back a few days before. And eventually it, it does take care of the seizures and I haven't had seizures. I, I say on December 19th we have increased the dosage. I think at first I was trying to use the old pills that I had and kind of cut them in half. And So I, I would take one pill and a half, but I got new pills and the new pills did, did the trick where the seizures were not coming back. Um, then on December 2nd, uh, 22nd, uh, I had my third hospitalization. And at that time, they decided to stop the temolozomide because I had a blood test, and the blood test showed that I had neutropenia, which is one possible side effect of temolozomide. So my oncologist figured that the temolozomide was causing it, and I stopped taking it, and it took care of that problem. But because uh, of the neutropenia, I couldn't get a methotrexate to drink that hospitalization. They just gave me rituximab and then sent me on my way. So then on January 5th of 2021, I had my third round of methotrexate. And this round caused um, an attack of gout, probably due to the Lasix. So as I was leaving, I had the edema in my legs, and they wanted me to uh, 
to excrete the water. So they gave they gave me Lasex, and I think the dose was a bit too high for somebody who has gout. After the fact, I went on the internet and I realized that if you have gout Lasex, you need to be careful because it can trigger an attack. So I didn't mention it to my oncologist who talked to the, the team uh, of doctors and then they adjusted my Lasix later so that it wouldn't happen again. And I have to tell you, when you get chemo, chemo is not uh, something that is given by one person to one person. It's not like going to the doctor, like you have the sniffles, you go to your primary care physician, you might see a nurse, you see your doctor, there are two people at most with you and then you're on your way. Chemo, you have a whole team around you. You have, when the doctors come into your room to make the rounds, you have, often you have three doctors coming together at the same time. Uh, you have uh, the whole nurse, nurses. If you're there for four days, you're gonna have maybe eight nurses taking care of you. It depends on their shift and, you know, sometimes nurses come back, but. Um, and you have your oncologist who's kind of directing all of those people. So I talked to my oncologist, I said, you know, careful with the Lasix because I have gout and then they took care of it. And I didn't have any other attack while I was uh, undergoing chemo. Uh, on January 14th, I had my meeting with the stem cell transplant specialist at Johns Hopkins. Because after the chemo, the plan was to get the stem cell transplant, which I did get. Um, so we started talking about scheduling and arranging for the transplant and filling out the forms. And one of the forms I had to fill out was uh, a dental clearance. So on January 21st, I saw the dentist um, and he, uh, so he did his work to give me a dental clearance. Uh, the first, the first uh, visit with him, I think they ha I had a de debridement and we talked about the plan, what the plan was. Um, and then I had other visits a little bit later to uh, patch the holes and do more cleaning and stuff like that. Um, and it's important for uh, stem cell transplant patients to get the clearance because if your teeth are not in good shape and you have cavities or stuff like that, and the, and the transplant, they whack your uh, immune system, um, it should get to zero, basically. And um, if you do have cavities or any problem in your mouth, then I suppose bacteria can get into the, your blood that way and, and you could be in big trouble, you can die from it. Uh, so I needed the dental clearance, so I started that on January 21st. Um, on January 24th, I had my fourth round of methotrexate, and this time I vomited twice. And the first time I vomited, I could, you know, I had my, I had pizza, I remember I had pizza for supper, and uh, 15 minutes later the pizza was in the bucket. <laughs> um, I could feel the nausea come in. Uh, it, it was not like a long time before, but I had maybe like two, three minutes of warning that, yep, this pizza was coming back out. Um, another thing during that visit is that I was transferred to a negative pressure room because my shingles had been activated. And that's peculiar to me because I don't remember being ill when I was a child with the, you know, what causes the shingles, I, I had no recollection of that. And my shingles were so mild that we think that probably when I was a child, I had a mild case. Um, so as an adult with the shingles, I, I had heard my mother and other people who had the shingles talk about it. And they were saying it was very painful and very itchy and they were scratching their face or their arms or their back or de depending on where it was. And um, in my case, I didn't feel them at all. Um, a nurse eventually came into my room and looked at my forehead and she said, oh, you have lesions on your forehead, that's strange. And uh, she correctly identified them as possibly shingles. Um, and then they did a swab test. So it was not that it just looked like shingles, it was shingles. The swab test came back positive. 
but they immediately move me to a negative pressure room to prevent me from infecting other patients. And they gave me anti uh, antivirals. I was going to say antibiotics. It's not antibi antibiotics. And antivirals for uh, the shingles. So I have I had a mild case. I did not feel them at all. I was lucky. Um, on February 9th, I had my fifth round of methotrexate. At that time, I vomited four times. Um, I got an MRI at the hospital, and the reason I got it to the hospital was because the company subcontracted by my insurance to check on approvals, called me and told me that I could not get it off patient at Johns Hopkins because they're not, on, well, I could have, but they're not on the network, so I would have to pay more to get it there, or more than more. I mean, I would have to go from a bill of zero dollars to a bill of, I don't know how many dollars exactly, but I would have had to pay for the MRI. Instead, what I did is that I hung up on the lady and I called my oncologist and said, this is how it is. He said, well, come in, we're going to have your MRI done when you're in the hospital. Uh, and the insurance paid for it. If it's in the hospital, the insurance pays for it. And if it's outpatient, the insurance, the insurance doesn't pay for it. Um, I think this is complete nonsense. Either an institution should be covered or not. But no, that's not how it works. There's some logic there, which is very mysterious and in my mind stupid. But that's the way it is. Uh, after the MRI, my doctor, my oncologist told me that I was in remission, officially. Um, and I did ask about shortening the treatment because he said, you're in remission. And I said, well, should we stop? He said, no. And I learned later, I, I watched a talk on, on the internet, and I learned later that the way they decide how long your chemo is going to be, it's six to eight weeks for primary CNS patients. And they're going to go to eight weeks if you tolerate the chemo well. And if you don't tolerate it well, then they're going to talk about going down to six weeks. So <laughs> if you're doing well, you're rewarded by having a longer chemo, <laughs> longer misery, <laughs> which is all right. You know, I didn't dispute what my oncologist was saying me that I should get the whole chemo. I just, I just took it. Um, On February 16th, I saw the dentist again uh, for cleanup and some patching. Um, on February 23rd, I had my sixth round of methotrexate and I vomited twice again. Um, on March 12th, I had my se seventh round of methotrexate and at that time I did not vomit. And the difference was that I had talked in the meantime to my oncologist and I think they tried things first to to try to not get me to vomit but at that point the last time before before march 12th that the, the, the meeting i had with my oncologist just before that admission to the hospital i had brought up the topic of amend which is an anti-emetic and i had learned on the internet that some people had had good results with it and i said well maybe we should try that add amend to my regimen and i Maybe it's going to work and I'm not going to vomit. And it did work and I didn't vomit. I was not feeling great. I had a lot of gas that time, I think. Uh, and I know it's gas because the last time I, I had my uh, chemo, they did give me gas X and it took care of the problem. So at that time I had a lot of gas. It was not, it was not great. You know, chemo is never great. But uh, at least I was not vomiting. Um... On the 18th, I saw Dr. Handa, who's an ocular oncologist, which is a very specialized uh, uh, field uh, where you have somebody who's basically an oncologist and he's also an ophthalmologist. Um, and he was able to examine my eyes and tell me, you know, what, why I had problems. And he could see the scarring on my eyes and stuff like that. Um, and that's what I needed at that time. You know, the ophthalmologists were all very help. Well, some of them were helpful, 
they could they could only do as much as they could but the dr handa was really useful uh, because he's an ocular oncologist and there are maybe 30 people i was told there are maybe 30 something people in the u.s that can do what he does um on march 21st i got my first shot of the pfizer vaccine um on March 28th, I had my last round of methotrexate. I did not vomit, so the MN was still working. I have a note about diapers here. Um, throughout my my chemo, I had, at some point, at the be very beginning, I was not wearing diapers, but I soon had to start wearing diapers. And the reason for that is that every time I had methotrexate, I had to lose at least one loose bowel movement, boom movement afterwards, and sometimes more than one. Um, but at some point, I decided that it was safer for me to wear a diaper after I got my methotrexate rather than risk messing up the bed. Because if you think about it, if you mess up the bed because you're proud or whatever, um, it means that you have to call the nurse, tell her you messed up the bed, and then they have to replace the, the sheets and clean the bed and so on and so forth. It's a lot of work. So I decided I should just wear a diaper and um, that's it. And the diaper did provide protection a few times. At first I was using the hospital diapers and they were okay, but I didn't find them great. And then I bought my own diapers and I brought them with me in the hospital every time. And um, yeah, that I that was mostly fine. Um, then, then after I had my last round of chemo, and I don't remember it was before my second shot of the Pfizer vaccine, but after my last round of chemo, I didn't have an antibody test, and the antibody test was negative. They didn't find any antibodies, and. The question is, um, first of all, the question is, should you get the vaccine while you're on chemo or rituximab? And some people say no, some people say yes. My oncologist says there's no clear contraindication um, to getting the vaccine, so you should get it. It's not going to harm you. You're not going to go infertile. You're not going to have a heart attack. Your, your balls are not going to become giant. Um, so you should just take it and, you know, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Uh, so that's what I did. I, I took it, uh, when he told me to take it, which was before my last round of chemo. Then I had my last round of chemo. Then they did, um, the antibody test. I had no antibodies. And what no antibodies means, sometimes people are confused about that because they say, oh, I had no antibodies, therefore I cannot combat COVID, but that's not the case. If they do find antibodies, the presumption is that you you do have protection against COVID. But if they don't find antibodies, the conclusion is we don't know what's going to happen. Your body could start producing antibodies once you're infected, but it may not. We don't know. We just don't know. So they didn't find antibodies. Um, but I do know now that I have antibodies at this moment, but at that time I didn't. So uh, then on April 8th, I fired the stem cell transplant specialist that was uh, seeing me at uh, Johns Hopkins. And uh, I fired him because communication with his staff was non-existent. They were not responding to my emails. Uh, and I've never seen that. I've never seen that at Johns Hopkins and I've never seen that at UMMC. So we, it was special, but the head of the transplant unit there decided to go to the bat for his employee, and I we had a meeting, and he started spewing out a whole lot of nonsense, and from that point on, for me, I did not trust him. So I said, you know, I'm going to have my stem cell transplant at UMMC instead of Johns Hopkins. And I told that to my oncologist, who... Um, agreed that I shouldn't get it at Johns Hopkins. And there's going to be an episode later about the transplant, but 
not only did I avoid that idiot uh, taking care of me, but I also it was also better for me to go to UMMC because they're doing it in a different in a different way, which I think is better. We save money uh, by going to UMMC versus uh, Johns Hopkins. On April 11th, I got my second shot of the Pfizer uh, COVID uh, vaccine. On April 19th, uh, I saw Dr. Handa, again, uh, the ocular oncologist for my eyes. Um, and so that's about that's about it for you know the the chemo. Um, so the lessons learned. Um, first of all, you should always communicate with your doctors. Um, and everybody around you when you're getting health care communicate with everyone if something doesn't work complain if my first discharge didn't work I, I complained I complained also about the food at Johns Hopkins I probably will have a special episode about that I complained about um, billing I will also have a special episode about that um, but if the side effects don't suit you you should tell your doctor about that, and so so that they can do something about it. And sometimes I'm I'm on I'm online and I'm on forums and I'm on Reddit and I see the lymphoma sub subreddit, and I see people that are usually younger than I am and they come on and they start asking all kinds of questions. And the first thing that comes to my mind is why are those questions not put to the care team? You know, I'm having so much fever. What should I do? That's not a question for us. It's a question for your care team. There are multiple reasons we cannot answer. First reason is that we're, most of us are not doctors. Second reason is that even if there's a doctor, on, and I know there's a, at least one doctor on, on Reddit that probably reads the lymphoma stuff, but maybe I don't know how much he reads of it. But he's there. But even a doctor on Reddit... The doctor is not going to do a diagnosis because they don't know your, your medical history. And you're not going to give me your medical history in a little paragraph. Um, so talk to your team. If if the symptoms don't set, are not good for you, if you have problems, if you have... You can have all kinds of things during chemo. And, and one thing that I say to people is that the doctor comes along with a list of uh, possible side effects, but the side effects that you are going to get is not determined by that. I call it the wheel of side effects. So you spin the wheel, and then the wheel turns, and then eventually it lands on a side effect like vomiting or diarrhea or all kinds of things. You can have um, neuropathy. Uh, you can have sores in the mouth, you can have a reflux, you can have uh, bigger digestive problems and diarrhea, you can have pain, you can have fatigue, you can have, there are all kinds of things that you can have. But our bodies are all different and people don't get the same side effects from those drugs. It's worse, you know, if you think about, about you know, something like aspirin or Tylenol, Usually people react pretty much the same to those medicines, although there are some exceptions. But people um, that undergo chemo, there's a much wider range of side effects in my experience than um, people to people taking Tylenol. Um, so talk to your doctor. I told them that I had problems with vomiting, they changed their regimen and then took care of it. I had somebody told me that the, the chemo was going to get progressively worse as I go along, but it's not been the case for me. The first three times I didn't vomit, the next three times I did vomit, and the last two times were better than the three in the middle because they changed my antiemetic regimen and then I only had gas. And the last time the gas even was not there because they gave me gas X and I was able to get rid of it. Uh, so talk, don't be shy about problems that you have. You know, I was vomiting in front of my 
the nurses. I was call if I felt that I was going to vomit, I called the nurse. I get I got my bucket right in front of me, and I called the nurse, and I was vomiting in the bucket, and I wanted her to know that that, that was happening. Just vomit. If you if you have a bowel problem and you need to change the diapers or you're wearing diapers, I let my all my nurses know that I was when I when I got the diapers on, I was arriving there without diapers. But after I got the methotrexate, I was putting the diaper on at some point, and I told them I'm on diapers now. Uh, don't be surprised if you, you know, when they're going to poke you and do more, all whatever they, they need to do to you. And if you if you say diaper, don't be surprised. I'm on diapers. Um, sometimes I see people on, on, online that are younger than I am, and they, they kind of you know, it feels like they're self-conscious. Don't don't worry about that. The nurses and the doctors there have probably seen all kinds of things. You know they have they have stuff. Um, you know sometimes you go on YouTube and you see videos of oh the most bizarre stuff in medicine. And you see somebody with the an X-ray of someone and there's some sort of uh, foreign object in their gut. <laughs> gut there, God knows how. They're doctors. They've seen it all. Your vomiting or or bowel movements are not going to phase them unless maybe you start messing up the bed. So you have your diapers ready. Uh, so you need to talk to them for them to be able to respond to you and get you the, the care that you want. And I know sometimes it can be difficult. There are some... Uh, people for instance and you know i say you need to talk to them and if you're in the middle of the treatment and it's not working well with your doctor um then well i mean i guess you're in a tough place i would try to repair that relationship but if you have any chance of detecting that there's going to be a problem before you start treatment the best way f for you is to get another doctor or, or another opinion or something else um like I did with the stem cell transplant specialist at Johns Hopkins, I decided just, no, I'm not going to deal with them. Uh, because what I saw was terrible. Uh, but fortunately, the stem cell transplant hadn't started yet, so I had the chance to switch uh, doctors. Um, if you're young, it can be difficult because your parents have a say in your treatment, uh, but you need to be able to talk to your parents to be able to tell them, you know, um, I have this side effect or that side effect and the medicine is not working, we need to talk to the doctor. And if they love you, they're going to be on your side. Uh, and there are some people also I know from all discussions online that are very far away from good centers and they're going to say, well, it's to get to a good center, you know, my current oncologist, it doesn't work with me, but, and if I want a second opinion and get to a good center and get good treatment, it's going to be three, four, five, six hours of driving. Uh, and I feel for them because at one hour, the one hour limit, I, I'm, I'm done. You know, I'm, <laughs> I go to Baltimore, I'm fine. Um, I wouldn't want to have to drive more than that, really. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, I know people online who've, told me or the broader community their stories and they live two three four hours away from the their treatment center and sometimes that's what you need to do to get uh, a good service you need you need to travel I'm you know I'm very sorry <laughs> but sometimes sometimes for especially for cancer you know it's not the sniffles you're not having um, a cold, it's cancer, it's, it's serious. And if you you get treated by the wrong person, you, you could die. So to get good treatment, I, I encourage people to question their doctor, talk to their doctor, and if it doesn't work, get service somewhere else, like I did. I, I mentioned before, I fired most of the doctors that were involved in my health care. Um, I do not trust the local hospital. I go to Johns Hopkins now, and for Johns Hopkins, I didn't trust them to do my stem cell transplant because of the guy there. So I went to UMMC to get my stem cell transplant. 
So um, communication is, is key. Um, so I've been ranting for about half an hour now. Um, so I guess the next episode I'm going to start talking about the stem cell transplant. Uh, because it's the next step in my treatment. I finished chemo now. Uh, I didn't ring the bell because there was no bell. <laughs> I, I don't know. I didn't see any bell. Uh, but it doesn't matter. I don't care about that. I finished my chemo. Next time I'm going to start talking about the stem cell transplant because uh, that's the next step uh, in my uh, treatment. So with this, um, I'm going to say goodbye and uh, see you uh, next episode.